This evening, I'm just going to introduce our wonderful speaker, my friend and colleague, Agnes Vinaguajo. Uh, put simply, she is Minister of Health for the Republic of Rwanda. But Agnes is so much more than a Minister of Health. So let me just explain why she is so much more for a moment. First of all, she's a pediatrician. Um, it's not very common to have medical doctors as ministers of health. It's usually said that's a bad thing. But I think there's something the UK could learn from having somebody who actually knows about the subject <laughs> as a minister of health. I, I think that, uh, I, 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 I do think, Nigel Crisp's in the audience, that we really could turn the world upside down and learn a lot, actually, from what's taking place in Rwanda right now. Um, Agnes has had a distinguished career um, in her country. She led the National AIDS Control Commission. She was permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health, and she has academic appointments at both Harvard and Dartmouth College. And that's where Agnes is even more unusual as a Minister of Health, because she takes research and evidence seriously. And that is why she's here this evening. At the moment, she's serving on two commissions that we have running, one on a commission on women in health and one on a commission on investing in health. We had a meeting uh, last year on the commission on uh, women in health, and it was held at another university in London, which I wouldn't dare mention here. Um, and we had a day or a couple of days of discussion, and Agnes was invited, and quite honestly, we didn't think she would come. She's a Minister of Health. She has heavy responsibilities elsewhere. She came, and we thought, well, she'll come and maybe for half an hour to an hour, and then she must go and do other things that her embassy will instruct her to do. In fact, she spent the entire day with us, taking part vigorously in discussions about the direction that the Commission should go. She's a serious intellectual, and she seriously engages with issues that matter. And that's another reason why she's here this evening. In July, she invited us all to go to Kigali for a meeting of the Commission on Investing in Health. And we were her guests there. And we witnessed firsthand a remarkable health transformation that's taking place in Rwanda. You're all fully aware that next year is the 20th anniversary of the genocide that took place in Rwanda in 1994. And quite literally, the country has had to be built from every community upwards, almost from scratch. And in one of the first slides she showed of what she's doing as Minister of Health, it was entitled Building a Health System. And that is what she and her incredible team have been doing. It's a tough challenge, and there are many challenges still to go. But if you look at various measures of what's taken place in Rwanda under her leadership, PMTCT, vaccination coverage, preventing malaria, family planning, and addressing the emerging epidemic of non-communicable diseases, she is literally leading a health transformation, one that the rest of the world needs to pay serious attention to. And she's not just a one minister show. She is concerned about building capacity in her country. And she has an amazing team that she's put together. And one of the requirements for her team is that they all have to pursue postgraduate studies in a particular discipline relevant to their role in the Minister of Health. There's another thing we could learn from Rwanda in the way we construct our Ministry of Health. It's a real pleasure this evening to welcome Agnes Binaguajo, and her title already is provocative. Charity does not rhyme with development. Let's create a new partnership, the golden age for global health. Please welcome Agnes Binaguajo. <laughs> everybody. So thank you for your kind words. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, why I'm in your commission is because I believe that history has to, put, to be written. And uh, 
article in The Lancet or report in The Lancet and many other journals influence politicians. And I want you to influence politicians in this part of the world to do better their job. <laughs> it will help us to do better our job. So, but I'm very humbled to be here uh, this evening and uh, thank you, Richard and Anthony Costello, to have invited me. Thank you also to your great team because I was, I was really uh, welcome and helped. Uh, today, it's a general title. I guess that the majority of you are in the health sector, isn't it? But what I'm going to tell you, it's about, it's in general. Because health is just a piece of what concerns people. So I'm going, of course, to speak uh, as a recipient of that aid and also as, a pro as a, somebody who is running the health sector. Yes. So this is Rwanda. I think that you can Google it and have it, so I'm not going to uh, spend uh, many time on this. The only thing I want you to see is that we have increased life expectancy more than double it. More than double it, without really being more rich, the majority of our people still live under one dollar, but they have access to health. Meaning, money is not everything. In the... What I have to tell you also, money is not everything, and if it's, I don't present you my country, I think that I have to say that um, I have a lot of respect to be with you here today. Because 20, as uh, Richard said, less than 20 years ago, our country was totally destroyed, devastated. Doctors has, either has been killed, nurses too, because I want to tell you that a genocide starts by killing the intellectual so that it cannot be a barrier between that. So we had a country that was totally destroyed. And the, the fact, if somebody has said that 20 years ago, we will be here talking about what we think the world should do uh, with a lot of experience to talk about it, it's really uh, not, it was really not uh, uh, probable. So this is the, money that went in the health sector. But if we want to talk about Africa in general now, more than one trillion dollar, it's a lot of zero, I don't know even how much it is, but more than one trillion dollar has been given in general to Africa for its development the last 50 years. In health also, this is only for health. But what we need to know is that the revenue per capita, people are more poor in part of Africa than they were 50 years ago. So what happened that this massive influx of head, of aid, didn't bear fruit in Africa? There is something to think about. And there is something wrong. Because this money, guys, is your taxes. You are sweating for that. Or if not yours, because you are young, but it's not everybody who's young here. <laughs> it's the money of your parents. Huh? The, if it's not for not producing resume, they better give that to you so you go to the pub on Friday, isn't it? Yeah. So there is something we should think about. How come that this money didn't bear fruit? Too early. I want also to say something else. The majority of the countries in Africa have a growth between 5 and 8 percent. Uh -huh. In one hand, a lot of money, no result, and in the other hand, those countries are growing. How come they are growing with a little investment in economic development because there were less money invested in economic development than in health. But those countries are taking off 
whatever. There is with little investment, there is a good return. And in the other hand, people are coming poor and poor. Majority of African countries will not meet the MDGs, and the MDGs, what we say in Rwanda, was not the ceiling. It was the flow. And they are not going to make it. So let's talk about why this money didn't work. And let's talk about if you invest in Africa correctly, you have 8% return systematically every year. Do your bank give that return? <laughs> no? So it's quite good. The majority of the money has gone like this. This is a slide showing what happened in Tanzania. Huh? But for Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, we have somebody from Malawi here. Where are you? Is it correct? You recognize your country. So this is the international Africa way to do business in the health sector. When you are, you talk about aid money. Impossible to find your way. It came so fragmented that it has no impact. Money is decided in London, Paris, Geneva, Washington, New York. Now it starts in Pekin, but not in your capital, my capital, and the other capital of Africa, where the people are living. So there is no match with the real need of the countries and the amount of money that is coming. And as if you have, let's say, $1 million, and you give it to one person, one institution that is very good to implement, they will have a coordinator. This coordinator will have a house, a car, etc. But if you give that to this multitude of people, there is a multitude of coordinator, a multitude of car, a multitude of houses, and you end with 60% of the money your parents or yourself are sweating for that make Toyota more rich. Just to, talk, to say a, a, a brand for a car. Huh? And what go in the ground of or people like my friend Tom to come and implement with us how to save babies, what is remaining, if we are lucky, 40%. So there is a new way to do business we have to think about. This also gives another problem. Because you have so many people that are working for the same program, and they all ask you to do a report with all of them having specific indicators that has been decided again in New York, Geneva, etc., And that has nothing to do with your real life. So in place of to, to spend a lot of hours to run programs or to give care, we have to give a lot of reports and we have asked them, please, you are very intelligent people. You all go in great universities like this one. Could you come together and have one framework we can discuss with? 2007, I remember December in Devon, all the people who are dealing with monitoring and evaluation in PEPFAR, Global Fund, WHO, UNAID, and many other institutions I even don't know, invited us and we, and we went in Devon, I remember. And they decided to go and talk together, to come, because PMTCT is PMTCT. Yeah? It's a mother with HIV positive, with a baby in her body, and the virus should not go to the baby. Huh? And for this, we have a treatment that is very simple. It's the same everywhere. And the way to give it and the way to monitor how to give it should be simple. You agree with me? Ah, no. <laughs> you and me are wrong. 
In London, it's not the same than in Washington. They are going to, to find an indicator that is totally, not totally different, because it's still the same woman, but that is different. Because in this part of the world, they will say, OK, it's the number of women HIV positive that go to two antenatal clinics. Another, three. Another, four. Another, going there, but malnourished. Another, going there, malnourished, with the miracle of this. And you continue, and you continue, and you have to fill those reports. And the poor nurse in the health center, with a queue of people to treat, have to fill this. Because if we don't fill it, they will say, lack of accountability. We don't know what you do with your money, with our money. Even if the baby is safe, and we go and show the baby, this one is safe, is it HIV negative? Yes. But the mother, what was her work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, with those type of fragmentation, it's impossible for country. We should make a master's in NGO management. Are you ready to do that? It will help us a lot, huh? because also something, many of those who receive money got the money from the government or from foundation, like Bill Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Skoll Foundation here in UK, SIF uh, Foundation. And those have also their own indicators. So, they receive money, but we, in Africa, and I take the example of Rwanda, we also don't know the amount of money they receive. We know the target we have to reach, but we don't know with how much. And it's not our business, but it's still your money people who have sweat with, because even it's school foundation, there is somebody called school one day who worked and make a lot of money, put it aside and say, this will serve for the good health of the people in the, on earth. Hmm? But well, I guess this one is dead, but the other one should inform us totally what is for Rwanda. It's another <coughs> accountability area. We should know for how much you sweat for me. And so this is a problem. The other issue, this is Google Map, is just to show you that poverty, HIV, malaria, infant death, and we can continue all this, are linked. So, if you really want to tackle HIV, you should go for comprehensive development. That's why I say that the, the, what we think here, what we are talking about, is really the overall development process. Fighting disease and fighting poverty have to go together. If we just come and give pills, we will never end disease. We need education, and that's why we are ready to partner with you. We need factories. We need the know-how how to do those pills. And this is the only sustainable way to go. So, talking about tackling all those diseases, those are infectious diseases and uh, the majority of cause of death, it's take a journey for education. So, that's why development aid doesn't rhyme with charity. Because charity doesn't rhyme with sustainability. 
If you give me a coin because I'm starving today and I'm going to die maybe before tonight, you don't give me the capacity to eat tomorrow. And for an entire continent, we need the capacity of dealing with this tomorrow. Who remember that? Hmm? This is the Marshall Plan. A massive aid given by the US to a portion of Europe to boost their development. And it works. So that means we cannot say that we don't know what to do. There were no conditionality, MUAC of, of uh, UK ladies, number of antenatal clinic of, of, no, it's not UK, sorry, German. Hmm? Huh? There were no measurements and et cetera. The measurement was economic growth. The money was given and massively. The money was well used and massively. And out of the taxes, with the industry that we're putting back together, the countries buy both, sorry, education, health, social protection, build road to go and get health, railway, bridge, diplomacy, universities, etc., etc. That's what we call now budgetary approach in the language modern because, you know, we have to change language. This is something we have Peter Piot in this room. He was head of the UN, UNAIDS. He will tell you if every five years we don't change names, hmm, we are feel old. Hmm? So, but this is, this means I give you money to boost your economy and I'm just asking you to prove that your economy is working. And not what we... You know, when I start HIV AIDS, you know how many indicators I was supposed to sign off? 800. 800. On everything. People didn't lose their time on that. So. This was working. With this Marshall Plan, we should see the quantity of health. It's a good study. UK have, no, not UK, Germany has bring to their people just through taxpayer generated domestic revenue. So, I like this slide, and uh, it accompanied me the last year. It's uh, done by a certain Sidney Harris. I, I email him and I say how, how much I like this slide. So, in Rwanda, we still have, we, we managed to pull out of abject poverty one million people the last 10 years. We have managed to create a community health insurance that cover, we have universal coverage, and people are no longer dying with what we call basic, uh, what, what is in the rank is basic care. We have also universal access to HIV drugs, universal coverage of malaria prevention with two bed nets per family. It's not that every family has two bed nets, but in average, there is two bed nets per family. We have decreased death by, due to HIV, due to TB, due to malaria, all, all for more than 80%. Our cohort of people living with HIV AIDS have 90% survival with more than 60% viral load depression, um, depressed. Better than UK, better than New York, better than Paris. 
How we do that is because of the health sector we have. And why I put this, I like this, is because, first of all, five, no, let's say, seven years ago, when I, I was going in conference like this, people was, were telling me propaganda. Propaganda, it's politic. I'm a minister, but I don't do politic. My president today, I was, I was my first day in cabinet, I was there with six other new minister. ministers. He told us, don't come and play politics. Go for results. You are there for the welfare of our people. Just go at work and make the life of people better. And when I was saying that, <coughs> come back, people were saying propaganda. And now that the measurement have been done by external bodies, not by us, people say, ah, it was true. <laughs> My goodness, what is that miracle? Hmm? And unfortunately, and that's why we need to partner, we are so few, and people are working so hard, we don't have time to write. Hmm? If we say, from a country where malaria was the biggest killer. And now we are in process of eliminating it. How have we done it? Is it the, what we did with environment? Is it the spray? Is it the prevention? Is it the mosquito net? Is it, is it, is it? We didn't measure. We just, we just saved life. Hmm? We were in the emergency period. Now it's more calm. We better study. This is the life expectancy at birth, how it claim. It claim with the revenue per capita. It's another proof that what we do in health totally depend of the social economic situation of the country. But it's not enough because we are not very far, far from our target. Many people still have less than $400 a year. So, the, those gain doesn't reflect money. And it's another good thing to study. What are the impact of policies? What are the impact of the financial part? When many countries want to know, and even ourselves, we would like to know, This is the Institute of Health Metrics who have done it, London School and Washington University in Seattle. And you can see in blue the nutritional deficiency over time. In the year 90s, beginning, you see that up to 2000, we were not good. It was the, the, still the consequence of the genocide and, and, and infrastructure destroyed and people killed. And after that, going down drastically. What I want to tell you with this, it is that we can see by studies those figure where the next problem is. And we can start to work on it. As I told you, we, we, have to, we have control HIV, TB, malaria, digestive diseases, etc. We have the kids, I don't want here to say glory, but as a pediatrician, I like that figure. We have the kids, the best vaccinated on earth. They have 11 vaccines. 90% have all the doses of 11 vaccines. The six recommended by WHO, diphtheria, cocano, tetanus, cochlear, polio, etc., plus rotavirus, meningitis, polio, uh, uh, 
uh, rotavirus, meningitis, hepatitis, pneumococcal, and HPV. So, we have already a decline in under five mortality with the rotavirus and the pneumococcal. Malaria control is going to be better. You can see what emerge. We'll see emerging non-communicable disease. Does, I, I don't think I have that slide here. Yes. We can see emerging, it's the same principle, but for non-communicable disease injury and neonatal condition. You see in the bottom, the neonatal deaths are going to have a bigger proportion because the other causes of death are under control. It's not that children will die more. It's that the proportion of death due to that will be more important. So we are working on training our people all along the chain of the care delivery for this. But if I'm going to a big partner and I show them this, oh, sorry, and I show them this, and I say, if we want to be efficient, we continue to do what we do in TB, in TB malaria, HIV, HPV, blah, 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 blah. But we should invest a bit in neonatology. They are looking at us. How difficult it is. Tom is there. We're working together. They just look at you like, my goodness, but okay, she's a pediatrician, it's normal. <laughs> but in fact, it's the next problem. Hmm? And you can see also, those, those studies are talking a lot. Can you see the proportion of mental health increasing? This is Rwanda, where this was a lot in proportion, but people were dying more of infectious disease. Huh? The epidemic of suicide, etc., is something across the world. And when you don't die, with infectious disease, in any case, we all die. The latest is the best, but we all finish by dying. <laughs> huh? But you see the proportion is increasing. And this is what is done due to war. Huh? You can see the date. This is, so just to tell you that we need to partner to study our setting. This is the Demographic and Health Survey. I can talk about it because it's not us who is doing it. It's Macro Atlanta, and it's a partnership with WHO UNICEF. And also, it's the slide that I like a lot. You know why? Because it just tells me that I'm doing my job. <laughs> hmm? You know why? This is the rate of decrease in child mortality. And you can see that the poorest have the biggest increase. These are the highest. That means opportunities are well um, the opportunities are well spread among the rich and the poor. And this is one of the reasons we are successful, because my target is not my grandchild. I have a grandchild I love, I have to talk about her. <laughs> My target is the child of the poorest woman in Rwanda. Because when she will be served and the child will be safe, that means all the others will be served also. And this shows us that it works. This is a national policy in Rwanda. Whatever you do, you have to tackle the most vulnerable. Tom, you are visiting Rwanda every two weeks. Tell them if I'm wrong. But by doing so, it's so easy. Because the, when you tackle the, 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 the most vulnerable, the, the others are following. I'm going to tell you, and also we have twist the aid we had to reach that. Because 
2004, 5, 6, 7, we were using drastically the money for HIV, because the money that was available was HIV, TB and malaria. Try to say at that time, we want to save women. Nobody was listening. You know, a woman, the woman at that time was only the prostitute at risk of HIV. Other women don't exist. So we have, for, with HIV money, we have built antenatal clinic, pediatric, capacity to do vaccination, and later on, Gavi came. It was very efficient. And this is the result of that, because there is no global fund for under five. There is none, and they are dying a lot. There is no global movement for neonatology where the, the, the majority of deaths occur. I'm going to tell you another story about aid. <coughs> Mutuel de Santé, it's our community health insurance. Mutuel de Santé, how it take off in Rwanda, it take off with the support of Global Fund. There were very revolutionary people at Global Fund, and we explained that it will strengthen the system, they let us try, we won the grant, the grant was done by His Excellency the First Lady and the Minister of Health. Me, I was in the National AIDS Control Commission. And we won the grant. And we won the capacity to give a health insurance to the one million poorest Rwandan. So we did. And when the less poor saw that the poorest have better access than them to care, they all rush and pay the two dollars. Yeah, without a lot of movement, because people used to say in Rwanda, people are on the line and do because it's a dictatorship. Try to explain to people, you know, we are bad, but we love you. We are very bad, we are dictators, but we will keep you alive. We are bad and dictators, but we put you at school. 96% of children are in school. Before the genocide, you know how many? The, the country was producing only 3,000 high-level educated people a year for 10 million people. Can you imagine that? How many students you have in this your university, Provost? How many students? 27,000. Can you imagine? Now the country produced still not enough, but more than 100,000. Hmm? And we have teachers. We try, we borrow teachers from the US. We have 100 US teachers on ground for a year. They, they come at the condition they do the entire academic year. And you believe that people are going to head such a government? They say yes, but there is no dialogue, social dialogue. No. I think that the way we use the aid and make it more efficient for the most vulnerable, this is the key that have transformed the way we have success with the money. So when everybody was rushing to pay one, two dollar per household, the rest was subventioned by domestic funds. We just call consultation and say, okay, we have this money from Global Fund for the poorest, this money from domestic fund for uh, what is missing, now, if we want to give you more care, we need the $2 no longer per household, but per capita. Our partners say, are you crazy? They are too poor. You know, those $2 is the cost of uh, one beer, isn't it? I have a colleague from Rwanda there. It's the cost of one beer per capita. So we told them it's one beer per capita. They will drink a beer and of course, the women drink less than the men, so no problem, it's good for everybody. <coughs> we did so, but we had opposition in this country too, in World Bank, in many partners, they said no. People did it, they were very happy. And I, let me tell you, there is, you can, the one thing you became addicted to is access to care. The more you access care, the more care you want. Isn't it? Huh? 
Did you see what happened in some of the countries called wealthy, where the consumption of care is almost, you want to say, stop, hmm? because it's too much. Now that the people were used, you know, in the beginning, I guess, they have a headache, they live with it. After that, they had a headache, malaria, we treat malaria, they feel better. Now, sometimes you have a headache without any reason, you take a paracetamol or acid acetyl salicylic. Now they are that. So that means the, the more you are used to care, the more you use care, and the more you are addicted to care, and that's very good. But that means also you need to increase the contribution and the premium. So in 20, 2011, there was another big, it took, that one took two years, consultation, national consultation, and say, we are going to make people pay according to their revenue. And now people who are, like me, pay $12 per capita of people in their house. People who are, like my secretary, called mid middle class, paying, are paying uh, $5 per capita. And people who are poor, 25% of the population, don't pay at all. When we pay your health insurance, you have 90% of the care supported. You pay 10%. For the people who doesn't pay the premium, we decided to pay at point of care, even if it's a high transactional cost, because we want everybody to understand that care has a cost. And we don't want to go for free. We want people to understand that somebody somewhere pay. So we receive the bill at point of care. But we have 92% of our people that are covered. So this is the story of one aid that was efficient because it entered totally in our view, and Global Fund is good for that. This is the child mortality decline. You see the, here it was again around the destruction of the health sector. But after that, you see the decline faster ever because even if we follow the natural curve, we should be here. You see? So there is something that I don't uh, like is when people say, Oh, yes, you are good, but it's because of uh, everything was destroyed and you can invent a new Rwanda. Don't say that. It's because, as Richard said, there is a lot of dedicated people that are spending sleepless nights to try to find step by step what is the best move hmm? for reaching even more. Because as my president have said, MDGs is not the ceiling, it is the floor. Hmm? But we want to show you that because there is another slide I didn't bring because I didn't want to bury my friend Richard. Uh, because I show, I, we saw him, we show him that slide when he was in Rwanda. If we look the number of lives saved by investment per capita of aid and in addition domestic funds, Rwanda is among the lowest with the maximum result. Same for women, life safe, same for children. So there is something else that needs to be studied. This is my health sector. And this slide show you, this is, it is exactly the same as this, but put it flat. This is the central level. This is with referral hospital, with the, the ministry and agency that are working. These are the district hospital. We have 42 around the country. These are the health center. We have almost 500 around the country. And these are the villages. In each village, we have community health workers. In each district uh, health center, we have nurses. Here start the doctors. Here are 
start the specialist in referral and in the ministry, like Richard have said, all the staff have a master. They have got it at work. They enter with the degree and me, I challenge them and I say, I want you to have a master, we will find the money to pay it. Hmm? Another way of good investment. And don't believe that the time they spend out of work is losing for me. They enter with these skills, they start to work with, and they get this one. Now that they go for a PhD, wow, we are going to have the Minister of Health the most strong on us, read by PhD owner. And it has changed our way to do things because they know what evidence-based mean. They know what research mean. They know uh, you don't do a policy because you feel like that today. Huh? Huh? Oh, no, 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 it's very important. You know, if I talk with somebody who is totally uh, for elderly people, I'll do a policy for elderly people, you know. So we go with the real needs and studies, evidence-based. That has what has brought that for me. And at central level, up to here, district hospital, they are all doing a master or they have their master. And here, I have already more than 20 people running for a PhD. And they're still at work. I don't let come, them come here. No, 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 no. They can come two weeks, one month, etc. not more. You help them where they are. But doing so, you know, we have all along the system, a lot of quality data you cannot imagine. We are, Rwanda is a very organized country. People are keeping the data very well from here to here. You talk to community health workers. Those are people who doesn't have, they just know how to read and write. You cannot imagine how they own their business. And where I put that for aid, you see here, all the community health workers, there are 45,000, three per village, two women, one man. One man and a woman for common diseases. One and a woman for following the maternal and child thing, uh, health. They all have a phone. Hmm? And when they have an alert, here, immediately, an SMS. We, um, we, we captured the SMS in the Ministry of Health, also the mobile emergency uh, system, the ambulances got it, and the people are served almost immediately. Before having that, and we did so with the support of Global Fund and USID, but it was a struggle because they don't see how this brings health it has decreased by almost five, the death of women. Because they were dying because we were there too late. Now, we know the, the message is come from here, here, there, and we follow the ambulances, and the ambulances come from somewhere here. Hmm? Same for children. Here, everybody in the health center have a computer and report the, in the health information system all the epidemiology. Same for this level and, of course, ourselves. Now, in the ministry, all ministries are reporting eBay's to the prime minister. We no longer send paperwork. We can have paper, but we don't. We, I always say that we should be a award for carbon saving. Hmm? Isn't it? No, it's very good. And having this, we don't have more personnel. We still have only 600 doctors for 11 million people, 10 million point five. The number of specialists are very few. But it allows us to task shift and to do remote supervision to assure that the care is well done, or at least not damageable. When we start to do all those things, 
HIV, TB, malaria. Every time people were saying, not sustainable, don't go for that. Two, three years ago, we start HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine was so high, but Merck was agreed to give us the vaccine for three years. Shall I say no to save at least two cohorts of young future women, to save them for cervical cancer? They say, yes, but those populations doesn't know that they have a cervix. How am I going to? OK, that's true. So we went in campaign and we explained to women, this is a uterus, this is a cervix, and the cancer, blah, blah, blah. And they say, yes, but it's not sustainable. What are they going to do after? We say, we don't care. We'll find a solution after. We don't lose that opportunity. They say, they will never do it. It's impossible. They will spoil your name. They say that to Merck. And Merck, at a certain point, hesitated. I had to call very influential former friends and say, before you were in administration, you were part of the civil, mo civil movement for the IOVs to Africa. You remember that period? You are two young guys. But it was a fight. Peter, you remember? Say that all African has the right to IOVs. They say, not sustainable. They don't know how to read time. They will never follow the old prescription. They are singer, dancer, not serious. They will spoil the, general, the, the global uh, epidemic, create resistance, and we are going to be lost. Who remember that period? Thanks to crazy people like Peter. He said, no, we go for that. And now, in our our continent, adherence is better than here. For other reasons that are more linked to the social cohesion, a nice study done in Boston, but for HPV, the fight was starting again. I advise you to read some, I think it was published in The Lancet, saying that I was a criminal because I, sell, I sold I don't know how you, you, you do that uh, verb. I have given my young people to a pharmaceutical firm. Hmm? Can you imagine that? Do their people think about that when they are vaccinated people here? You know, we vaccinate the entire cohort of girls age 11 because the demographic and health survey show us that first intercourse that doesn't start before 12. All the school, because we decided to do school-based, it was more easy for us, and they say, it's crazy, we never do that at national level. How are they going to do? We just partner with Minister of Education, Minister of Local Government, the Minister of Internal Security, you know why? Not because people are going to stall the cars, uh, the, 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 the vaccine, but just because those, this ministry have a lot of cars and everywhere in Rwanda for the police. So we borrow the car, and in three days, our vaccine, leave Kigali, go in truck, go in every schools, with the help of the, 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 the nurses here in health center, they go in every school, they vaccine the kids. With the help of community health workers here, community health workers during those three days watch the children that are not at school, at school and propose the vaccine at health center. 93% compliance for three doses across a year. And over the three years, more than 90% compliance for the, vac the HPV vaccine. This is another aid effectiveness because it was not government to government. It was a PPP, public-private partnership. And we didn't tap tackle enough in PPP. Now it has given me ideas, and I'm going to dialogue with a motorbike producer to create ambulances at community level. You know why? Because for this telephone, we have now an agreement with Samsung to upgrade them so that the community health workers can follow 
and understand what, they, what we do, what they do, their job, and compare with others. And it is so important to give to the people the capacity to own their work, the capacity to understand what they do, so that they are actors of their own development and not only followers and people that I execute. It changed everything. So that the more also, there is something that creates another addiction. Results. Those people are incredible. They didn't get salary in the beginning. Now we are paying them on the performance with another type of aid that is effective. It's a grant we get to, to World Bank, and we create all along the country. Little business, so Ministry of Health has created little business. Can you imagine that? Little business, 400 and something among them, for the community health workers. And the result, the, ben, the, ben, the outcome, the profit of those business will allow us to pay them on a regular basis. Investing in health by creating little business. You understand? Those community health workers are so proud, isn't it, Richard? They are so proud of their life. They have created their own domain. They are serving the people. And what makes them proud? They are elected by their peers in the village. And now job Minister of Health is just to train those elected. Only in terms of reference, be elected, know how to read and to report. You know that we had an epide cholera epidemic in Rwanda, in a refugee camp, a true cholera epidemic. I'm very proud to say no death, no delay, uh, confinement, I don't know if it's English, immediately, why? Thanks to the phone. And distribution of what to clean, the etc., etc. Thanks to the community health workers and the people all along the chain that thanks to ICT that manage our health sector, we have good communication immediately. From here, we can send an SMS to 45,000 people. One person here can alert us and we alert 45,000 people. So this is let's say, good health investment. I don't know how many time I still have. So when people are telling us not sustainable, now we are laughing. Because if we say 1966, or 1966, the word sustainable was pronounced, let's say, less than 10,000 times a day. At the present day, it's a lot. In 2036, the it will be in each pages. In that day, each sentence. And sometime, it will be only that. <laughs> Don't laugh, you know. When we have a good idea and we sell it, it comes so often. So what we say, sustain, the word sustainable is according to some people, unsustainable. But when you have a good idea, always go for it. Money is not the, ba the true barrier, because if you can prove after that the delivery of health is less expensive with your new idea, you should go for that, is investing in health. Another thing, it's not to please you, it's because it's a big debate. We have, and that's where we can partner. Many people that are really implementers experts, and nobody listened to them. By traveling around the world, Richard has done a very good piece of paper about it. 
Meaning, this part of the world should listen more to what our part of the world have as need. And also how we see and we envision to implement that. Don't come with solutions that are already drafted. Also, if we have managed to have those success, still there is a lot to do. Still, there is too many people dying for preventable things. Still, we still need to educate far more people for the health sector. But if we have managed that, it's because the coordination was strong. We have learned with HIV. HIV have tell us the three ones. One coordinating body, one action plan, one monitoring and evaluation plan. One way to educate so that everybody has the same protocols. And if somebody is sick in North, East, West, can be treated and go back home without discrepancy in the treatment. Many of our country, I don't know how it is in my sister country, Malawi, but for many people, that's the issue. We try to have an understanding in East Africa for HIV treatment hmm? and procure together. We don't have the same protocols. Or the majority of protocols bring the same effect. We just have decide, to decide together what is the best for all of us. We know it. But Geneva should listen more to all of us. And this was about. This is another story about aid effectiveness. One day, we received from Canada a call. We have dialysis machine. It was 2006. But Rwanda have to pay the, the, the shipment. And we say, oh, dialysis machine portable, that's genius, because we have those people with renal failure, we don't have the money to buy. So we pay the shipment, 18 machine. When we open the container, you know what was written? That's not a joke. They are still packed somewhere in Kigali, because to destroy them is too expensive. Yes effectiveness of aid. So, did that person really know when, because they contact our embassy in Canada, we agree to pay on tax of domestic funds? And the thing are there, if we want to destroy them, it's too expensive. So we don't have, we, Minister of Health, don't have the money to. I try to sell them to the vegetarian because it's for cows, dogs, but they laugh at me. And they are still there. It's also an example that aid should really meant to support and to make you going a step forward. The rest is really criminal. It's not a joke. We had to find a place because they were packed in the the vaccination uh, institution compound. And when we start to have, to increase the number of vaccine from six to seven, eight, nine, now 11, there were no more place. So we scream in Kigali to say where to put them. So they are still there. I think we should bring them in a museum of, of uh, nonsense. This is to show what we can do together. There are very good studies to do. You saw in, in, in red is the cost of IVs. In blue is the productivity gain. In green, it is the cost averted to have often. And in purple, it's saving by delaying end of life. So you can see with such a graph, I can go everywhere. I'll show you that investing in IRV bring economic growth. 
and support the development. Those are type of study that are interesting. There is no timer, so I don't know where I stand. It's okay? Not, I'm going quickly. <laughs> this is another thing. We can do good, even ourselves. We need to document, I told you. This is another area. I, it has been documented that we do the work, but publications are elsewhere. The people about our job are publishing 10, uh, 1,000 more than us about our job, about how we are sweating for inventing it. Hmm? That's why what I uh, call intellectual prostitution. So this is something also we can work on together. Of course, to do such an approach by, the, by listening, trust, and do with us, we need a legal framework, as well as doing research in Rwanda than the way we manage. Because we cannot put the blame on the developing world only for not following uh, what we have done, we, we have agreed at uh, international level, the way to proceed the aid. We need a strong legal framework, hmm? a strong law of finance, also procurement, also a manual of aid policy, so that everybody know what to do and follow. And also a tolerance zero for corruption. So also, Aid should really promote reverse innovation. There is a lot we can invent. And if I go to the community health workers and say, this is the problem we want to solve, how should you do that? They have a lot of ideas. So th that's how we can invent the way to implement things, or the way to do things, or the way to do something else. Don't believe that global health is, doesn't concern you and you just come and help us. We, you come to me, I come to you, for us together to have a good journey for better health for the world. Because if people of disease like that are spreading, you are not safe. We better work on it where it starts to spread. Because all the world are all the world is concerned. Also, I told you, Health is fundamentally social, so it needs to, to be tackled as, um, as uh, we need to tackle also the social determinant of health. And if health is a human right, tackling the social determinant of health is also in that category. I'm going to pass quickly on the example of MDRTB. This is the example of investing the money right produce more health per dollar invested. And I would like you to think about dealing with humanitarian as a business. Where do you put your energy to produce the more health? Just to show you that more result in decline per, per investment. Also, it's important to know that we manage that because we, we, we govern by cluster. The social clusters are all those ministries. And when I, I decided to, to, to do something in the health sector, I consult all my colleagues to see how we can work together. This is the comprehensive governance. So we have this. The solution is ownership. It is equity. You go for the more vulnerable. It is also science. You give evidence on what you, before taking decision. Participation. Never do something without the people concerned in as beneficiary or as um, uh, implementers. And if we can have those principles apply to the global, the, the, the money that is there outside for health, we will succeed. 
Those are the places where the decision has been made to respect country. There was Rome, after that there was Paris, and after that we changed the continent. We went to Accra. Still, statu quo. The burden of this is still on the countries that have to report differently, but the AHP plus never take off. Accountability of donors' country is very, very low. I want to show you that hospital is a hospital that was not sustainable because it was built in the middle of nowhere. And it's a beautiful hospital. I just want to tell you, it doesn't cost more to do beautiful things than to do bullshit. <laughs> it's the same cost. But the difference is this. And also, this now, we are working to make it a medical campus. We are going to have a new faculty of medicine, new faculty of this, in the middle of nowhere. We create cities, etc. Of course, there will be a market, and of course, there will be a cinema, because students need to relax, and also the teachers, etc. Secondary school, etc. I end in because I see that my friend is nervous. I talk too much. I'm very talkative. But I want to end on this because this is the philosophy. It's from Martin Luther King. And there is a word that I, they told me how to pronounce it, but I'm sure I'm going to pronounce it badly. True compassion means more than flagging, flagging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. You can change now by the international aid, and you have the solution. Thank you, Martin Luther King. Now, it wasn't that I wanted to cut you off. It's just that I know our audience might want to ask you some questions, because it's not every day that you will be coming here to UCL. So, um, now, the timetable was that we were going to finish at 7 so that you could go across and have a drink, but I'm going to steal a little bit of that time unless somebody waves violently at me from the back um, to give you a chance to make some points. So let's take three or four points from people from the audience and then we'll come back Can to Agnes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, who'd like to start? Yes, please, and if you could say who you are, the microphone will come and find you. Hello, I'm Jian Lee, studying currently at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. But I used to be part of the charity community <laughs> because I worked with World Vision for five years. And I deeply sympathize and agree with crazy indicators, the fact that economic development is a sustainable solution. But because there is always going to be some uh, charity people who take sustainability seriously, um, would you actually give suggestions uh, or some good cases you've seen of NGOs, external players, um, collaborating with community and, uh, and government in making uh, this development sustainable. Um, I think it would be wonderful to hear from you. That's great. Let's take a few comments. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Andrew Tompkins and I, I work in this institute. I think we've been absolutely um, uh, astounded to have such a clear vision of inspirational leadership. And you've shown what um, very, very strong and clear and excellent leadership gives at a health service delivery like no other country. Um, could you say something about the other side of the coin, which is the community? What movements were there within the community that possibly contributed towards the remarkable reduction in mortality? The, the reason I ask is that certainly in Africa, many other countries are looking not just at service delivery, but they're looking at ways in which social development and community participation uh, can make a big difference and be really helpful to have your comments on that. Thank you. Okay, there are two comments over there, a man in blue jumper and then a gentleman behind with a scarf. And I'm looking for gender equity here, so... Thank you very much. Um, Michael Heinrich, School of Pharmacy, um, the Head of Pharmacognosy, so Medicinal Plants. But a very different question, governance. I think the big challenge for me after your talk is how can we develop a governance structure which facilitates all this 
and this interplay between community, NGOs, and governments where, governments where things may go grossly wrong in many cases. Very good, thanks. And just behind you. Hi, I'm Chikwe Yankwazo. I'm a public health physician and I blog on Nigeria Health Watch. Um, a quick question, simply on leadership. Um, we're, we're, every African here today will be exceptionally proud of your presentation. But a question, what seems to be holding back your colleagues, ministers of other African countries in having the same type of vision, inspiration, and drive that you, you have demonstrated this evening? Simple question on leadership. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay. Agnes, come back oh, to you oh. on some of those. So this one is... Uh, <laughs> so the, the first question on NGOs, Madame ou Mademoiselle, I think we need to be clear. In Rwanda, the government coordinates. The government should never implement. We implement when there is nobody to implement correctly because we need to go, to, to, to go forward. Like, uh, but our objective is to have nationally the capacity. So NGOs, international NGOs, have a lot to, to do. But first of all, not to come and do business forever. Come and train Rwandan to do business forever. And also what we do, I think if we are here, we can learn to be here with the NGO. And when we are here, we learn to be here. And we will always partners. And that's how we have implemented the human resource for health. It's not that it was against NGO. We want other civil society to come at the stage we were. We want universities. So we implement the AIDS program ourselves. We, won, we, we save some money that we, we contract university, we, American universities, because it's American money, to come and teach our people. You see? So we always need this civil society, but different according the setting. I also want to remain that the systems are not created by NGOs. This is a big mistake. People come to create a country. No. You are there to help people to create their own country. Then it works. For the second question, uh, it was about, I don't know, uh, it was about uh, how, what, what the role of communities. Fantastic. We, there is something uh, that makes us all shivering, you know, because you believe that you are very popular. Mm -mm. My my measure is given by my community. Every year, they evaluate us, satisfaction. And the, this study is done by local government and report directly to the parliament. If I can do the best, if the people are not happy, they'll, black, they'll, they'll put me in red. So that means whatever we do, we need to explain and we make them part of the things, and don't do that without them. I, I'm going to give you an example, and African here will understand me. Normally, an African man think about talking to a child when the child is reasonable, isn't it? That was the tradition, Madame in Malawi. Hmm? Yeah, isn't it? It's the tradition, before it was the matter of the woman. What came with PMTCT? When we need the men to go and test for a baby he had even not seen. Hmm? It, it, there is a lot of cultural revolution in the health sector. It is the first time men in Africa are concerned with a baby that is even not born. Going and give his blood for something that have no existence in our, we don't talk, we don't consider traditionally, not now. Now, uh, a pregnancy is considered as a child. Hmm? Just to say that community are key. Don't think that what I ask you not to do with me, I can do that with the community. For the, the other question, the governance is very simple. When people are corrupt, where do you give them money? <laughs> <laughs> Corruption.
Corruption has two hands. You give me, I steal. You have given me, you know you are as guilty than me. So, the traditional way the North and the West give money to, to corrupt government is what has killed us. And I say to my colleagues, when you steal money, you, you damage my program because you remove trust from the world in Africa. The other thing we have to say, Africa, for the majority of people, is a black box, very damageable, full of mi microorganisms, dirty, <laughs> etc. And that's true. You know, I was, no, that's true that you think so, and that's, that's not true. There is a lot of hope in Africa. I can give you an example. The hotel I am, I have no complaint. There is, in the morning, there is full of black sh uh, uh, shit, the white there, some with blood, etc. If it was in Africa, none of you will cross those corridors. Because it's in London, we just cross and you say nothing. The image of things have a different signification according to the place of the world where we are. Hmm? In Africa, Somebody serve you a glass like that, you don't drink it because there is a lot of microbes. This discussion got two hours, etc. Was it clean when there was it, etc.? Here, we just drink and we don't ask questions. Mind shift, guys. We need to shift mind. Hmm? So that's what I want to say for the leadership. How to stop it? Stop to fund it. Or ask accountability. Why you don't ask accountability? And why my colleagues are not like me? Many are like me. Just I'm very talkative. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me go back and um, ask for a few. Yes, please. The microphone will find you. Yovan yeah. Madise uh, from Malawi. but. Uh, by the way, of the University of Southampton. And thank you so much uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And I, I really admired uh, everything you said and I admire you very much. And I echo what uh, my Nigerian colleague said about, we wish we had more of you. But I was interested in uh, what you said about um, giving uh, um, telephones to the community health workers and getting them to actually learn what's happening in other places. And I wondered about uh, the power of information for, for the communities and what role that plays. You know, does it help, for example, in terms of account accountability, but does it also help uh, change mindsets in, in the ways they actually deliver care and so on? We'll take another one. Joy. Microphone. It's just... Come. <laughs> Thank you so much, Agnes. As a fellow African woman, I was born in the bush of northern Uganda. I just collected the wrong skin. <laughs> I think it's fantastic not just to see an African woman on the platform, but to talk of the hope and the power and the reality of Africa today, not what people often see, which is the Africa of previous decades. Um, and you've shown us that change can happen. But I particularly want to point back to your, your slide about the burden of disease in Rwanda. And you highlighted the increasing proportion of neonatal deaths. And what you said is what we hear from ministers all over the world, that this is now our burden. And yet when they're saying that to donors, that isn't what the donors are funding. Donors are saying, no, we don't do that. So I would like to hear how you've answered that and how you think your fellow African ministers. And I'd just like to point out that Rwanda has shamed Britain because you have about four times as many female MPs as we do. So maybe that's your secret. <laughs> that's true. There was a question down here as well, I think. Yeah. Just here on the front on the second row. Thank you. I am Bemiro Shoda in the um, pediatrician, um, Nigerian. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very for, for your lecture. I, you've addressed the collaboration that takes place or that is meant to take place between what is often referred to as the North and the South. What I'd like to ask you is 
What are your thoughts in terms of how best to go about collaboration between South and South? That's one. The, the, um, the second question. Oh, um, yeah, okay. very quick. No, go on, very quick. Go on, go on. Okay. The, 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 the second um, um, question I wanted to ask is um, in, in terms of the if you like, the, the details um, of um, interaction between, well, the various participants. Um, to, how do you engage the local community in determining what needs doing? I'm not just talking about the research processes, that, for example, in controlling schistosomiasis, you should build a bridge rather than giving treatment uh, to children. Okay, very good. And then Cam, just there. It's just there. Thank you. Uh, Cam Stocks, I'm the National Director of Medicine, which is the UK's Global Health Student Network. Um, you very astutely identified at the beginning of your talk that this is a room full of young faces. And so um, I just wondered, um, first of all, uh, what was the contribution of youth to this incredible change that happened in Rwanda, and how are you including people in, in the developments that you're making in the future? And secondly, to this room full of, uh, of future global health leaders, what's, what's your one key message? <laughs> That's great. Okay, back to you. To global health <laughs> Okay, so um, it started with the telephone. Uh, how the telephone have changed mindset? It's incredible how the telephone changed mindset. The power of communication. That means the world became a little village, but Rwanda became a little portion of a village. Meaning, by knowing they can communicate with us, they, are, they, they take more risk. Huh? Uh, they know how to ask um, advice. They feel empowered to do their job by people also knowing that they have that power, go more to them to seek services. Hmm? But it's not the, 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 the only way uh, that uh, it, it works. It gives also more accountability to people like me. Hmm? Because we have, I, I was supposed, but it's too long, we have what we call a national dialogue day. It's two days where we are like you, sitting in the parliament, chaired by His Excellency, co-chaired by the Prime Minister. In the room, we have all the head of the army, the police, all governors, all mayors, all people who have a decision. We are more than 800. And people, there is a screen, communicate with SMS, there is Facebook, there is Twitter, and there is a phone. And let me tell you, it's soon. And it's my too hard day. You know why? Because everything can be asked. And that's good. Because if I mistreat a worker, it's his day. <laughs> because on Twitter, it doesn't disappear. Hmm? And there is a Twitter for that. And His Excellency and many people are reading those tweets. So if I am a bad lady, it will transpire. If somebody is bad somewhere, it will transpire. And you have people who just, as I told you, we have three phones per village. That's for health only. We have also a phone for anti-corruption. We have also a phone for other sectors. So phone are there, communication are there, those there are there, thanks God. You know why? Like one day, people say, I was entitled to receive a cow with this program. I didn't receive it because I don't have a land but I was receiving that call to increase my economic growth. Immediately in that very setting, which sector you come? Who is the mayor from this sector? Governor May, tell us what happened. So police, tell the police to go and see if it's true. It's true, bring the car back to the guy. Now, are there many other, are there many other cases like that? Immediately, the, we receive the Minister of Agriculture and uh, the police receive one month to track all the cows that get to the wrong person. You understand? This is what we call That's accountability kind of day. Yeah. People like, like me, I had to inform, to explain. Uh, the, the, I was PS at that time. There was another minister, Minister Cezibera, who had to explain 
why we have closed all the A2 nurses' school. And we had to explain it's because we opened A1. We want degree. We stop the secondary at the secondary level, and we have graded. If people doesn't understand, that's what I call, let's say, direct democracy. But it's it's good. So phone are key in changing mindset. Also, how we engage communities. There was another question. How we engage the communities. I think people are good. They just need to understand and have to be explained. But also, sometimes, we need to make them feel uncomfortable, leaving the, your comfortable zone. Hmm? What we did for maternal health, uh, death, for example, we have the maternal death audit. If a woman, before we didn't know what happened, where the woman was disappearing. For the woman who die in hospital or health center, there is a professional autopsy. We have to say what happened. For those who die in the village, there is what we call the community autopsy, meaning there is a committee created with religious, private sector, local leaders, etc., who go in that house and say what happened to that lady. She was not supposed to die. Did she complain before, etc.? Everybody knows that. So men doesn't want to be asked. So now when a woman say, ah, they say, let's go to the health center. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the best way to do. You do moral pressure for the good. Hmm? So that's how we engage, uh, an example to engage community. For the collaboration South-South, you are a very good country. We have a collaboration with you. You bring some health professional for two years in Rwanda. But I think that we need to collaboration for better understanding our health sector. We have difference, but we have similar population. So uh, also, we should start to collaborate in production. That means today, if all the houses of the health want a mosquito net, there is no, not enough production. Isn't it? How can we start production in the continent to serve the continent where we don't have? Don't replicate, but where we don't have. And this country can do this, this country can do that, and together we don't replicate, and we create economic growth also. Also, um, newborns. the new newborns. newborn, how we engage, I don't, the question exactly is what we say to get money or? Why aren't donors supporting newborn health despite the fact that Because they didn't understand. Them. And, they are, and they, are, they are in their comfortable zone, again, in New York, Geneva, etc., and London. And then don't know that we can save children with little actions that doesn't cost a lot. And they are not interested. I think we need a new mindset. The charity should be in the heart and uh, removed from it. But if people tell you, this is my problem, believe them. Believe them. Hmm? And if we tell them, we'll be accountable with this, we will save this number of children. Just come and see. Hmm? And saving neonates is the best family planning tool. Because people have children because they don't trust that you will keep them alive. When I came back in Rwanda in 96, I had only two girls. My family just said, two girls, are you crazy? First of all, you need a boy. I said, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they will bring boys. Hmm? And after that, they say, only two. Me, I had eight. Only one is alive. You will die alone. You understand that? The best family planning tool is keeping the children alive in a peace land where people have access to care. Mm. The, the burden of disease. One key is, message. The key for, message, for you, I think. And the role of youth in the contribution. To the, the role of youth, youth are fantastic because they are not yet spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think that exchange are good. I love that. Hmm? But exchange. And also, the youth before coming, just teach them how to be humble. Humble. 
We have so much knowledge, life knowledge, in people that doesn't know how to write and to read. They are very, you know how people are very polite. Why I'm saying all those things is because probably my civil society education was somehow wrong. In, one, in Rwanda, like in many African countries, they are not telling what they think, but they don't like arrogance. And this slow collaboration. You go with humility to those people and just learn about them. Hmm? I have learned so much. They know so much. They don't know who is Archimed, but they know how to solve their life better than you do. So these are the message. Come with humility, and also young people of the world. Know that you can do the revolution peacefully. You are the one who will change. Huh? And uh, they are the future. Very powerful. Very well. um, the prof has given us a few minutes more, so I'm going to go top left there. Yes, please. Hello, Maria Matohor. I'm an industrial partnership manager for a UCL Enterprise. Uh, you mentioned something about the uh, public-private uh, partnership. I was just wondering if you could give some examples that you've used in Rwanda and it was very successful that it could be used in other places. Thank you. Okay. And Tom. Tom is a pediatrician in Rwanda, and I'm pleased to say has done a lot in terms of uh, health partnership with you in Rwanda. It's going to ask something a bit different, and that is here we're at a university, and we've heard about the great universities we have in the UK. What would you most like from our universities? <laughs> Let's take those two questions and then so, we'll... So, we'll... the public-private partnership, the telephone I show you, it's really a public-private partnership. The host is a company. The maintenance is a company. And uh, the government have found the money and also pay for those maintenance. You can do nothing now in a country like mine if the government doesn't give the seed something. I mean, if we don't have a private sector that will grow, we will go nowhere because a black bone of a country is the private sector. Even though I believe that the black bone of quality care and uh, well distributed should be coordinated by the government. But my dream is private sector strong in Rwanda, they pay a lot of taxes so that they can build hospitals. You see? So another example of PP of public-private partnership. There is public-private community partnership. You saw the 42 hospitals, this is called district hospitals. It's a PPCP, public-private community partnership. 40% of them belong to churches or to NGOs. We treat them the same. They have the same advantage and we pay 50% of the health professionals. In exchange, they acknowledge our health insurance, our system, and they have the same category of prices, and they accept everybody. If it's a Muslim uh, hospital, they don't have to be Muslim. Hmm? It has two advantages. We don't have to build all those 40%. We can concentrate in something else. And also, it brings the community on uh, the map. You saw the village and the health centers. In between, there is a lake called the cell. We have almost five, seven to ten cells uh, belonging to one health center. We want to propose a PPCP there by having a nurse, a two, running a health post. We don't pay her salary. She makes her own money by reimbursement of the care by health insurance and selling things in drugstore. The community give the place. The community elect the nurse. We recognize and we train her. So I think PPP is the future, at least in Africa. 
The other thing is what I, I like in your university. I like the rigor. I like, uh, I like education and I like academic, you know. Bon, at the condition that you don't delay saving life. Huh? Mm. Don't go for doing study only. Go your, your, your best um, uh, motivation should be saving life as soon as possible. But doing it with rigor, with good documentation, allowing young people to do research, make the brain of young people more smart, etc. That's great. That's what I like. Okay, now we could listen to you all evening, but, but there is a reception outside. I'd like to thank you, Agnes, on behalf of everybody in the audience.